In this series, we are exploring the role of the women of the Ahl al-Bayt after Ashura and how did they continue to lead the campaign against injustice and tyranny and how they suffered throughout this tragedy and what lessons we can learn from their struggle. According to some historians and jurists, the tragedy of Karbala was predetermined and predicted. There are some evidences which support this claim. For instance, during his lifetime, Prophet Muhammad was not only informed about Karbala and that his grandson Hussein ibn Ali would be slaughtered with his family in Karbala on the 10th of Muharram in 61 Hijri, but Angel Gabriel also handed over to him the sand where Imam Hussein's blood would be spilt. No doubt, the prophecy was true and Imam Hussein and his companions were massacred by Yazid ibn Mabiyah's forces. The tragedy of Karbala is unique. Unlike other events of history which are defined as they happen, Karbala is not just an event which happened in the 7th century. For the followers of Imam Hussein, it is a reoccurring phenomenon as they keep imagining and feeling the events of what occurred and this in turn keeps the tragedy of Karbala alive. It would be difficult and, to be precise, unfair to say who suffered more pain or fought more bravely on Ashura. Every person from Imam Hussein's camp fought and suffered the pain according to their capacity. For instance, Orn and Muhammad, sons of Lady Zainab, were too young to even hold a sword, but they fought bravely against the forces of Yazid. Similarly, the 75-year-old Habib ibn Mazahir, who was the oldest soldier of Imam Hussein, stood firmly in the middle of the battlefield and faced opponents with great endurance. They may have been 72 in numbers, but in spirits they were as high as their opponents, who were in the hundreds of thousands. It is important to mention here that Karbala is not just about male members being slaughtered on Ashura and similarly, the bravery is not exclusive to the male members of Imam Hussein's camp. Ashura was the first part of the divine sacrifice. The second and last part was post-Ashura, which was initiated on the evening of the 10th of Muharram, when male members were massacred and the remaining members, who were only women and children, were taken into captivity. Indeed, they were poor, devastated, dejected, and drained as the defenders and protectors of their caravans were no more. But it would be wrong to conclude the tragedy of Karbala was only about or ended with the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. The real battle was not about defeating Yazid militarily, but to defeat him with moral and spiritual legitimacy. From this perspective, the real battle began on the evening of Ashura as the women of the Prophet's household would challenge Yazid's authority. Imam Hussein's only surviving son, Ali, also known as Zain al Abidin, was left and he was ill throughout the battle and couldn't even get up from his bed. As a result, Lady Zainab took charge and led the campaign. The women of Karbala defied all preconceived and established notions of war and displayed miraculous capability and potential that women of the Prophet's family possessed. When discussing the tragedy of Karbala, many find themselves surprised to hear about the spirit and extraordinary resilience shown by the ladies of the family of the Holy Prophet But in all essence, this should come as no surprise for the most powerful and influential women in 6th century Arabia have emerged from none other than the very household of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the difficult tasks for the historians is to present exact numbers. More realistic to say that there were um, tens of women with Imam al Hussein, and some historians say it is close to 60 or more women being with Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura. Like I said, there are no specific historical records that would list or name all the women who were present. Therefore, we will focus only on those women who are well known and there is a general consensus 
on their presence in Karbala. Layla binte Abi Murrah al thakafi was the wife of Imam Hussein and mother of Fatima Sohara and Ali Akbar. Fatima Sohara was not in Karbala and stayed in Medina due to ill health. Yeah, uh, we named, uh, we have got her name Layla. She's also from uh, Saqifi tribe. And uh, uh, actually we got two Laylas in, uh, um, in the battlefield of Karbala with different tribes, but in the family of uh, Mawla Ali al-Islam or uh, in the battlefield of Karbala. So they got sons, they, one of from um, uh, Layla got Ali Akbar, and one of Layla I have read that got names, Abdullah, uh, you know, son, or, you know, they, they sacrificed their sons. It is important to mention here that the story of Karbala is mainly based on the testimonies given by Yazid's soldiers when they were later captured by the forces of Mukhtar al thakafi the Battle of Karbala on the day of Ashura happened almost 1400 years ago. So one, it's a very long time. Secondly, the main narrators that we have for Maqtal, for the incidents, for the, for the details of the incidents on the day of Ashura are generally the opponents of Imam al Hussein, are the enemies of Imam al Hussein. And that creates even greater difficulty in terms of whether their information was reliable or not, whether their information was accurate or not whether their information was a personal opinion or no, they had facts, they, they had known these individuals, they had known these figures, they had actually recorded this. And in addition to that, has there been any censorship on what has happened? Because, because remember, the, the ruling party was the enemy of Imam Hussein salam, the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. So the censorship and the propaganda that must have ruled at the time must have been so, um, so powerful and so well established. Similarly, the women of the Ahlul Bayt were known for their piety and modesty, as they never came out without covering their head. Therefore, it is not possible for Yazid's soldiers to identify each lady during their testimonies, as many of them would have never have seen or recognized the ladies of the Ahlul Bayt. In addition to that, as we had centuries upon centuries throughout the history, then, as we have, um, you know, information that has been passed on to us reliably and accurately, there was information that was being added, sometimes inaccurately, sometimes maliciously. Some of this information talks about the women on the camp of Imam al Hussein, whether a wife or a sister or a daughter, going out and giving the impression as if they went out of their place, for example, na'udhu billah, without hijab or without proper hijab or that they were wailing in front of the enemies, or that they were in a position that was inappropriate for them, in a disrespectful position in front of their enemies. And most of our ulama, if not all of them agree, that th this is completely uncharacteristic of such great figures who were with Imam al Hussein on the day of Karbala. Therefore, we find confusions over the presence of different women. Among them is Layla. The disagreement there is whether Layla was in Karbala or she wasn't. Now some historians say she wasn't in Karbala and some historians say no, there are narrations that says that Imam Hussein salam went back to her and told her, and this is what we hear in some of the majalis, that told her to pray for Ali al-Akbar when he was fighting uh, the, um, the opponent that he had at the time. But different accounts suggest that she was present and witnessing the whole battle with her own eyes. Upon review of some of our historical books, some of the books like written by Sheikh Al-Mufid or Sheikh Al-Baha'i or the books that are written by none, uh, by other historians um, that talk about the incident of Karbala, they do narrate that there was a woman upon the martyrdom of Ali Al-Akbar who came out of the camp of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and her words were like this Walada wa thamarata fuada. You know, these words were words that are generally mean, Oh my son, oh the fruit of my heart, oh my son. And she repeated these words and they said that she was a woman of great reverence, of a great respect, 
and she was like a moon when she came out. When we look at these statements, these statements do appear to be a statement of a mother rather than an aunt because she is saying walada wa thamarata fuada or the fruit of my heart. This is a figurative word or figurative statement used in Arabic, but it generally means it's the, ma it's the father or the mother who would use such statements. And using these references, they say that yes, very possibly that Layla alayha, was in Karbala. Her name was Amina and there are scholarly evidences available which prove her presence in Karbala. I do believe and many of the great scholars have written in their books that uh, Layla was present in Karbala. And Marhum uh, Sayyid Murtada Burqai mentioned more than 24 references um, uh, that she was present in Karbala. In a maqtal called uh, Sahabi Rahmat, um, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Abbas Ismaili Yazdi has mentioned that Layla was present. Her title was Layla, but her real name was Amina, according to uh, Ali Muhammad Hussain wa Ashabu by uh, Sheikh Fadl Ali Al Qazwini. So he says that her name was Amina. But very few people know her by her birth name. Sometimes the titles become more famous than the names. So her, na her title has become more famous than her name has itself. So everyone calls her Layla and no one actually knows her by her name Amina. So I do believe that she was present. Ali Akbar, son of Lady Layla, was a strong gentleman and more importantly, he used to resemble the Holy Prophet Muhammad. That is why on many occasions when Ali Akbar had tried to seek permission to become the first martyr on the day of Ashura, Imam Hussein refused by saying that I can't let you die. Your face reminds me of my grandfather. And what kind of a father who has a son like you would allow him to go out alone and die in this scorching heat? Indeed, it would have been difficult for any father to send his son knowing that he will be martyred. But again, the tragedy of Karbala was not a personal battle between individuals where personal feelings tend to play a significant role. Karbala was divine, predetermined and prophesized by different prophets, from Prophet Adam to Prophet Muhammad. Imam Hussain, who was chosen for this divine sacrifice, knew that there would be a day when he would have to choose the will of Allah over his love for his son, and Karbala is the epitome of sacrificing oneself for Allah. So when Imam Hussein allowed his son Ali Akbar to go to the battlefield, he grieved about the son he was about to lose. God, you are witness against them that I am sending one of your servants, who most resembles your messenger in appearance and temperament. Blessings upon his family. Similarly, it was also a hard decision for a mother to send her young son into battle, knowing that Yazid's forces were in their thousands. It was an absolute miracle that he would be able to come off the battlefield, to come back to them. She submitted. She understood that, yes, I may lose my son, but my son will become Shaheed. And this was more important than anything else. When Ali Akbar came onto the battlefield, he repeated these words several times. I am Ali bin Hussein bin Ali, and by the Lord of the Kaaba, we are closer to the Prophet than you. By God, the son of an immoral person will not judge us. Lady Layla was in the camp when Ali Akbar was fighting. She could not directly see him, so she was dependent on Imam Hussain's expressions. We find her watching the battle. But not watching the battle through her own eyes, but watching the battle as she watched Imam Hussein and his reaction to what was happening to Ali ibn Akbar on the battlefield. 
when Ali ibn Akbar was doing well, the father is standing proud. But if he takes a blow, he shows it on his face and in his body language. We have little information about Lady Layla and what happened to her after Ashura and how her life was in Yazid's prison. But her attachment to her son, Ali Akbar, has significantly influenced the writing of Urdu and Farsi poetry, known as Marcia. Ramla was the wife of the second Imam, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, and the mother of Qasim. Her full name was Ramla binti Salil ibn Abdullah al Bajli. There is a difference of opinion over her name. Few say that her name was Ramla, but other historians say that the name of Qasim's mother appears as Umm Farwa. Actual name was uh, Ramla or another name. So, but she used to call Umm Farwa and her, uh, she got four sons. So here we have, we, we, we can see another family. <laughs> امکان پایا جاتا ہے ہمارے اردو بولنے والے سماج اور معاشرے میں جناب قاسم کی مادری گرامی کا نام ام فروا کے نام ہی سے مشہور ہے سب لوگ اسی کو جانتے ہیں مگر ایسا نہیں ہے کہ ان کا نام یہی ایک تاریخ میں لکھا ہوا ہو جناب ام فروا کے یعنی جناب حضرت قاسم کے مادری گرامی کے دو نام اور بھی میں نے تاریخ میں دیکھے ہیں ایک نام رملا اور دوسرا نام نجمہ رملا عام طور سے مشہور ہے کہ آپ کا نام رملا تھا اور اردو زبان سے ہٹ کر کے دوسرے سماج اور معاشرے میں جو شیعہ حضرات ہیں رملا ہی کے نام سے زیادہ جانا جاتا ہے difference over her name is more cultural for example between Arab and non-Arab historians but there is a consensus around her presence during the tragedy of Karbala. After the death of Imam Hassan, Lady Ramla did not go back to her house, as widows usually do, but she remained in Medina and took care of Qasim. When Imam Hussein was leaving for Karbala, she then joined the caravan with her young Qasim. Any lady would hesitate or show reluctance to send their son to a battlefield but Lady Ramla was a lady of strong character. This is the fact that there is no one who is not coming to you. Or there is no one who is not coming to you. At that time, the man becomes a man who is not coming to you. How is it a man who is not coming to you? How is it a man who is not coming to you? How is it a man who is not coming to you? There is a small story that doesn't tell you that you have اس طرح کے کوئی احساسات کا اظہار کیا ہو اپنے عمل سے یا اپنے کلام کے ذریعے کربلا was the place where every mother wanted her son to be sacrificed first when lady ramla came to know that her son was being stopped by imam hussein she protested and requested that her son qasim be permitted to be sacrificed before ali akbar she realized that her husband imam hassan gave a will to her for the day of Ashura. Most important of moments, she remembered that Imam Hassan والسلام, told her that there would be a day when my brother would be involved in a battle. And on that day, I want for you to give my will to my son. This letter, this, this, this letter of instruction, not just to the son, but the letter that would go to the uncle, the brother. She could have easily withheld that, but she gave the letter. And when she gave the letter, and the son read the letter, and he takes it to his uncle, it is said that she had the clothing of Imam Hassan. And she allowed Qasim to put it on, and when Zainab and Um Kulthum and, and Imam Hussein, when they saw their nephew, they all began to cry because they all looked at him and said, he looks exactly like his father. 
The eagerness to send her son to the battlefield was to protect her imam. Again, this is about the mother. Understanding the position of the imam and allowing her son to reach the highest pinnacle that any son could reach, and that is the pinnacle of becoming shaheed and dying in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and defending not just his uncle, but more importantly, his imam. When Qasim came onto the battlefield, Umar ibn Sa'd saw him and said, By God, I'm going to attack him. When Umar ibn Sa'd struck Qasim, he fell as a result, and Qasim called out to his uncle, Imam Hussein, for help. Imam Hussein rushed to pick up the deceased Qasim, and when he was carrying him back to the camp, Imam Hussein said, May the people who killed you be deprived of God's mercy, because the one who will take them to task on the day of judgment on your behalf will be your grandfather. By God, it is difficult for your uncle to bear the thought that you called out to him and he was unable to respond to your call, or he tried to save your life but to no avail. By God, the number of people who are prepared to kill us are many and the helpers few. There is not a lot of information about what happened to Lady Rumla after Qasim's martyrdom, but one can imagine that to lose your child to attacking soldiers must have been a heartbreaking and traumatic sight. And Lady Rumla was not the only mother who witnessed this horror and lost her child. In fact, there is a long list of women who presented their sons for this divine sacrifice. <laughs>